الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. Last week we started talking about the eating practices of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And before we go into the next chapter, which talks about the bread accompaniments of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, I wanted to just talk briefly about the etiquettes of serving a guest and being a host as a Muslim. So I have listed around 26 different etiquettes. Etiquette number one of being a guest is that a person should go when they have been invited. I mean, a person should not turn up to the house of an individual unless they have been granted prior permission and there's been a time arranged. This is a much better practice and it is of the good manners of a Muslim that if he goes to the house of somebody as a guest, he should try to go if he has received an invite and there has been a time arranged. And in this day and age, it's very easy to do that because we have mobile phones and we can send messages and make phone calls. So it's very simple to be able to arrange a time. So that is etiquette number one. Etiquette number two, even if there's been a time arranged, before you enter, you should knock. When the Sahaba used to come to the house of the Prophet وسلم, before they entered, they would always knock. And they would knock in a manner where it was not very loud. I mean, they used to knock using just their fingertips and fingernails. And the Prophet وسلم, says, when you enter a person's house, you should knock three times. And if you have seek permission three times and you have been unanswered after three times, then you should leave. But between each time where you seek permission, you should space out the time when you have knocked. For which duration? The scholars say for a duration it may take for someone to pray four units. Because that may be the situation that when you are knocking and they are occupied, they are currently in prayer. So you should space out your knocks and you should not knock more than three times. If that has happened, then you should assume that it is not a good time to come in. The third etiquette, I've listed around 20 plus, we'll see how many we get through. The third etiquette is to keep in mind the time you are going. For example, if you go to an individual's house and they may have children or babies, you may not want to ring the doorbell at specific times in case those individuals are sleeping in the house. The fourth etiquette is that when you go to an individual's house as a guest, you should not indulge in topics of gossiping and backbiting. One of the common topics when people go to other individuals' houses is about politics. So world politics, then mosque politics, family politics. This is a very common topic. The Quran says, لا بعضكم بعضا, that do not do backbiting of one another. That would one of you like to eat the dead flesh of one's brother? This is what backbiting is like. Surely you would despise that. So backbiting is like eating the dead flesh of one's brother. And the Prophet says, Min husnil islam al mar'i tarquhu ma la ya'ni. That from the beauty of one's Islam is that they do not speak about things that do not concern them. So that is the fourth etiquette. The fifth etiquette is that if you are in a gathering where there is food being presented, if there is a small number of guests, you should make an effort to sit with your guests. If there is a large number of guests, you should actually make an effort to ensure you are serving them and not occupied by seating with them. The reason why is if there is a large number, there is going to be more focus needed 
in being able to serve the guests. Whereas if there's a small number, it's more manageable, so it is more uh, courteous for you to actually just try to sit with the guests for a long, as long as possible. The next etiquette is that the Prophet ﷺ stated that the guest, he should be invited for one day and one night and it is from the minimum of hospitality that you allow him to stay for three days or three nights. Meaning if you have somebody traveling from a different country and he needs somewhere to stay, you can invite him for one day or one night and a minimum if he needs somewhere to stay, you have to let him stay for at least three days and three nights if you are capable of doing so. But anything beyond that is considered charity and the person hosting does not have to keep the person for more than three days and three nights. It's actually now the responsibility of the guests to not stay for longer and there is no more sin on the host if he does not want to keep the individual for more than three days and three nights. The eighth etiquette is that when you are eating food with your host, if there is a large amount of food, you should eat more than you usually would. The reason why is you want to show your guests that you appreciate all of the effort that they have made. If there is only a small amount of food, you should try to eat less. The reason why is there may be one specific plate of food and if you eat a lot, all of that one plate may have gone for you. So in these situations, you should eat less. So you should always try to do that thing which shows the most appreciation towards the host. So there is etiquettes from the host and there's also etiquettes from the guest. The ninth etiquette is that an individual should not criticize the food. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was, if he liked something, he ate it. If he did not like something, he would simply leave it and not say anything. He would never say, this is a bad food, so keep it away from me. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, if he liked, he ate. If he did not, he would silently leave. The next etiquette is that the host should try to make foods in accordance to the guests liking. The etiquette number 11 is to try and avoid having foods too late in the night and foods which are stimulating. What do I mean by stimulating? This is a very common practice now. I'm not saying this is, makes you a bad host if you do this, but in our culture, one thing that we do now, very late into the night, we have things like tea and coffee. What is the problem with doing that? The problem with doing that with tea and coffee, you have something called caffeine. What is caffeine designed to do? It's designed to keep your brain alert and awake. So when you have it, the caffeine in your system, it has a half-life of around 8 to 12 hours. Meaning it takes around 8 to 12 hours for that caffeine to come out from your system. Now one may think that I have tea and coffee late into the night and I never have any problem. The thing is, a person may sleep fine, but he will be harming something called his REM sleep. REM sleep means rapid eye movement sleep. This is the technical term for a person's deep sleep. This is when the repair and recovery happens in one's body. During the sleep of an individual, in the deep sleep specifically, the brain is literally being washed through the lymphatic system. If a person has caffeine in his system, he will struggle to get into this REM and deep sleep and he will not be allowing his body to recover in the manner it could. This is why certain people, they struggle to wake up for Fajr because they are having tea and coffee late into the day and it has a half-life of 8 to 12 hours even though you think it's probably not affecting your sleep, it's most likely affecting your deep sleep, which you do not notice. And I also mentioned, try to not have food late into the night. What is the reason behind this? If you have food right before bed, what is your body busy doing? Your body is busy digesting food, rather than becoming calm and tranquil before bed because before going to bed your body needs to be in a relaxed state 
If it is busy digesting food, it is using energy from the body to digest the food. I've written about 10-15 more, but we will try and just go through them quickly, maybe read only 4-5 more. Another thing is that the host should make an effort to separate mahram and non-mahram people. This is something that is not always honored, however it is very important in Islam that we do this. And if an individual unexpectedly encounters a non-mahram, it is falls upon him to lower his gaze. The next etiquette is that a guest should not take a seat until the host has made him sit somewhere. The next etiquette is that the younger people should let their elders sit in the places which are more comfortable. So if you see an elder and there is only a limited amount of space on perhaps a sofa, you should let the elder take that seat and the youngster can stay on the floor. The next etiquette is that you are allowed to decline invitations, but it must be for good reason. For example, you have scholars that are possibly writing books and if they were to continuously give up their time for every invite that they would get, they would never finish any of their objectives. The next etiquette is to try and make your guest feel like they are welcome to stay as long as possible, meaning you do not ask them about their plans up until the three days and three nights have passed. At this point, you can now begin to ask them about their plans and about when they are planning to leave and if you are incapable or it is a burden upon you to keep them for longer, you can discuss it after the three days and three nights have passed because it's at this point where their stay is no longer something that you should do. Rather, it, the Prophet ﷺ referred to it as sadaqah. Just as 2.5% of your wealth being given away is fard, anything beyond that is no longer zakat fard, it is simply just sadaqah. Same with the guest, three days and three nights, if he needs somewhere to stay, you let him stay. Beyond that is sadaqah. The last thing, or the last few things, is that you should try to invite guests who are considered good company because the Prophet says ala dini that a person is upon the religion of his friend man that a person should look at who he takes as his friend the next thing is that people should try to serve foods which are healthy and good to the body the Prophet says Inna li jasadik alayka haqqa That indeed your body has a right over you. The Prophet also says Al mu'minu al qawi khayrun wa ahabu ila Allah min al mu'min al da'if wa fi kullin khayr That the strong and healthy believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. However, there is still good in both. The Prophet wasallam, there was once a time where a young boy was eating and he was moving his hands around to the different places frantically and the Prophet wasallam, stopped him from doing that. He said to him, Sammillah, that say Bismillah and Kul biyaminik, that eat with your right hand wa kul mimma yalik and eat from that which is in front of you. So from amongst the etiquettes of a Muslim is that when he eats, he does not try to eat from far away places, rather he should try to eat from what is in front of him. If he wants something that's far away, then people should be passing around the food or you should ask politely. And the last etiquette is that after you eat the food, you thank Allah. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّهُ that if you are thankful, we shall give you more. So we shall come into the chapter of the Messenger of Allah's bread accompaniments. This is a very long chapter, so perhaps we will only read the first three, four hadith, and then we will carry on from next week. So bread accompaniments means anything that can be easily swallowed with bread, and it can even refer to food, because the Prophet ﷺ said the chief 
of all bread accompaniments. The word for it in Arabic is Ida. For the people in this world and the next is meat. So the best bread accompaniment that the Prophet ﷺ said is meat. But even still the Prophet ﷺ did not have meat very often because this was more of a celebrity food. Meaning a food if you had it in excess it would be considered as extravagance. So the first hadith an Aisha ta anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala ni'ma al-idamu al-khal that Aisha relates that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said what a fine bread accompaniment idam is vinegar so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praised vinegar but the reason why he had such high praise for vinegar is not because it was necessarily from the best of foods however in this particular situation the only food that was available to the person hosting the Prophet ﷺ was simply just vinegar. So it was the habit of the Prophet ﷺ to show appreciation to what was available. He would not say something like, oh, there's only vinegar available, this is not proper food. The Prophet ﷺ would show his appreciation even though it was a very basic food to honor the guest, honor the host, sorry and say what a fine bread accompaniment is vinegar the next hadith an simak ibn har qala sami'tum nu'man ibn bashir yaqulu alastum fi ta'amin wa sharabin ma shi'tum laqad ra'aytu nabiyyukum sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ma yajidu min ad-daqal ma yamla' batnahu simak ibn har said i heard nu'man ibn bashir say do you not indulge in whatever food and drink you wish meaning do you not Allow yourself to have a full stomach. And then he replied, I saw that your Prophet ﷺ was unable to find even bad dates with which to fill his stomach. So it was very common that the Prophet ﷺ would not have access to a lot of food where he would eat to his full. And there were times where the Prophet ﷺ would struggle to never mind have fresh dates but even just bad dates. Such was the situation at times in the lifetime of the Prophet And even when the Prophet had access to plentiful food, he would recommend to people that the worst of all vessels you can fill is the stomach. But if you are to fill it, then only fill it for one food for food, one, uh, one third for food, one third for drink, and one third for air. So the Prophet وسلم, said, if you have plentiful food, then maintain the fact that you should not keep a entirely full stomach. Uh, we will read two more hadith and then we shall carry on from next week. And Zahad al Jarmi قال كنا عند أبي موسى الأشعري فأتي بلحم دجاج فتنحى رجلا من القوم فقال ما لك فقال إني رأيتها تأكل شيئا فحلفت أن لا أكلها قال أدن فإني رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يأكل لحم دجاج زهد مال جرمي said we were with Abu Musa al Ashari when he was served chicken meat by his servant one of the men in the group withdrew so he asked what is wrong with you he replied I saw it eat something so I swore that I would not eat it meaning I saw it eat something rotten so he swore he would not eat the chicken he replied come close for I saw the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam eat chicken meat. So chicken is something that it says here was eaten by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in this day and age chicken is a very commonly uh, eaten meat and you find chicken to be probably the most frequently eaten meat amongst the people and there are good things about chicken meaning it's a very lean meat and it does not consist of many calories but the problem when something becomes a mass distributed food and one of the most frequent foods is that people will now begin to try and cut costs. So what do they do? They try to make the chicken bigger in ways which are not natural and use antibiotics and hormones. So even though chicken is generally a good food, you should always try to look at the source of your food and the quality and the way in which it is raised because foods like chicken when it is so mass distributed and so frequently eaten by so many different people you have to take into consideration 
how these big companies would try to increase the profit margins as much as possible because this is one of the most popular eaten meats so if they can do anything to cut costs and increase profits they will do so that's why as Muslims it's extremely important to look at the source of your food and how it has been uh, taken care of the next hadith أن سفينة قال أكلت مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لحم هبارة سفينة the freed slave of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said I ate together with the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم لحم هبارة is a type of bird meat. The next final hadith that we should read أن عمر ابن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كل الزيت والدهن به فإنه من شجرة مباركة. عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه said the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said eat olive oil and apply it for it is from a blessed tree. so the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would have olive oil eat it and would also apply it to his hair. as we said before it's very important to look at how the food is sourced and the quality of the food. One of the issues with olive oil now is that it is normally mixed with other types of oils. So the olive oil you're getting may not necessarily be a pure olive oil. And another thing that happens is that when olive oils are taken, if the company does not want to take care of the olive oil, they will use rotten olives. So the harvest of the olive oil is also important and olive oil is from amongst the most powerful foods that an individual can eat and this is why this is something that the Prophet ﷺ recommended and olive oil, the word olive is also mentioned in the Quran to the point where Allah actually takes an oath, a qasam upon the word olive وَالْتِينِ zaitun by the fig and by the olive and we know that these are from amongst the most powerful foods in the world the Prophet ﷺ says that the fig is from the foods of Jannah the Prophet ﷺ has told us about many of the foods that are basically foods from Jannah like the Ajwa date in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ says As-Sakhratu min al-Jannah meaning the dome of the rock in Masjid al-Aqsa is from Jannah Wal-Ajwatu min al-Jannah and the Ajwa day from Medina is also from Jannah The Prophet ﷺ also refers to the pomegranate Ar-Rumman also mentioned in the Quran as from amongst the foods of Jannah so we should also try to seek out the types of foods that the Prophet ﷺ recommended and give them to our guests and try to be good hosts just as our Prophet ﷺ recommended. I pray Allah gives us the tawfiq to do amal upon all the good that we have said and He forgives us for our shortcomings.